Hi folks, this is the first lesson in our unit on non-continuity editing, the counterpart to continuity editing. Today's going to be a pretty short video on devices of discontinuity. And that's kind of an informal term for what I'm calling a number of editing techniques uh, that showcase a discontinuous aesthetic instead of a continuous one. The most famous uh, of them that I do really want you to know, and you'll be tested on this, is the jump cuts. Probably a term that you've heard before, though a lot of people uh, use the term in a more capacious way, but it means something quite particular. What is a jump cut? It's an elliptical cut that appears to be an interruption of a single shot. Uh, let's look at how this appears in its most famous instance, a film called Breathless by Jean-Luc Godard, a famous uh, French filmmaker associated with the French New Wave, uh, 1950s and 60s filmmaking. So let's just take a look at this particular sequence, and I'll try to call out the jump cuts. There's one as you see them. There's another one. And there's a third. So the idea with the jump cut is that technically, in terms of uh, Borderwell and Thompson, it violates what they call the 30 degree rule of continuity editing. Um, kind of an informal rule that means a shot must be followed by another shot taken from a position greater than 30 degrees, other, uh, uh, 30 degrees from that of the first. Otherwise, the image will appear to jump just like it does there. Um, that's the idea. The camera doesn't move, so it looks like we've jumped in time. Uh, Borderwell and Thompson say the jump cut interrupts the story with abrupt gaps. It is no accident that jump cuts have been prominently used by the contemporary filmmaker most associated, most associated with the challenge to classical narrative Jean-Luc Godard. Um, that's absolutely true, and you can see that tradition in our feature film for the so once again, where are these jump cuts? Because they elide a gap in time. Um, and that gap is pronounced because every time it cuts, the uh, camera position doesn't move, but the people seem to jump um, from one position to the next. Um, now, I want to point out the ways in which the jump cut, while it is associated with, say, modernist uh, or experimental technique, uh, a kind of technique that's against Hollywood, you see jump cuts all the time in Hollywood films. That's because, uh, for the most part, avant-garde techniques are adopted by the mainstream all the time. And you can see that in art house films, you can see that in contemporary Hollywood films, uh, you can see it in a kind of less radical way in this film, Old Boy, bar by Park Chan-wook from 2003. <laughs> I <laughs> 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 So this probably is consistent with the way that you've seen jump cuts used in contemporary Hollywood 
films, right? But in this particular case, you can say that the jump cuts are used to give an impression of the kind of almost interior state of this drunken person, a kind of uh, almost a blackout state in which he jumps from one situation to the next, presumably not remembering what he had just done. It gives that kind of impression. Also, you'll know that the jump cut is a great uh, device for comedy if you use it right. Um, it has this uh, sense of interrupting someone in, in the middle of their action. That's why it's particularly funny, I think, when uh, Desu, the character here, is uh, in the middle of screaming, and then we cut him off uh, to, to, to show the, the next amount of time, giving the impression that the edit itself has kind of silenced the character. Um, you've seen jump cuts in a film like Marie Antoinette, which is even less radical, I think, than the use in uh, Old Boy. What this does is it enhances the temporal condensation uh, in this montage sequence. You'll find that the jump cut here is fairly natural um, to what's going on in this sequence. And of course, one reason the jump cuts here don't seem very jarring, but actually seem to just pro provide a rhythmic flow to the sequence, is that this is a montage sequence with music allowing us to have a smooth sense of flow, right? It's already the idea that we're giving a glimpse into a kind of ritual that happens a number of times over Marie Antoinette's life. Um, and so you can play fast and loose with um, spatial temporal continuity, where we don't feel it as jarring as it traditionally is understood to be. Um, I mentioned this last week just to show you again. These accelerating jump cuts in Mad Max Fury Road happen almost uh, uh, in, in an unnoticed way, right? Um, just right there. Um, another kind of device of discontinuity might be called an unmotivated cutaway. Um, a cutaway is a Hollywood uh, editing technique in which uh, you do what the kind of device says. You cut away from the main action. Um, to kind of maybe provide a glimpse of an atmosphere. Let's say you're doing a street scene, you have two uh, characters uh, in, in conversation, and then you cut away to a kind of stray cat, and then you cut back to the conversation. That would be a cutaway, right? Sometimes it's used to mask certain mistakes in, um, in the, the main action, but also as part of just the cinematic language to provide a sense of atmosphere. Now, when you do a cutaway that doesn't feel as natural as that, you might call it an unmotivated cutaway. And a famous one you'll get in another film by Jean-Luc Godard, this time Contempt, away in a sense it happens in the middle of this person's journey um, but it's not a quite cons uh, a motivated cutaway or one that we understand is consistent with classical continuity because we don't know where the statue is with respect to the action it's not merely part of the atmosphere it almost seems like an interruption the film seems to ask us to meditate on this aesthetic choice why are we rotating around this statue um, uh, at this moment, and why does it interrupt the flow of this character's journey from A to B? Um, one of the most famous cutaways in the history of film is uh, this uh, famous vase shot from Yasujiro Ozu's film, Late Spring. The sequence involves a dramatic tension between a father and his daughter. 
The story revolves around the fact that the daughter feels the pressure to get married, but she doesn't want to because she has kind of grown accustomed to her life living with her father and tending to his needs. The father, in the same way, has grown accustomed to that life, but also feels the pressure of letting his daughter go and start her own family. And you get this sequence in which those tensions come to a head, and we get um, what many critics have thought to be um, a very notable and striking cutaway that interrupts the action. So what we're, getting, what we're getting here is actually more consistent with the logic of the cutaway. Why? Because the object that we cut away to is indeed uh, noticed as part of the atmosphere of the room. You can barely see it right here in the corner. It's not as if this is like the contempt example, the Jean-Luc Godard example, in which we cut to a, a statue that doesn't occupy the immediate location of a protagonist. Uh, in this case, the vase is in fact in the room. But its temporal placement in the scene, in fact, interrupting this uh, interior uh, kind of feeling, right? Notice that the vase interrupts the transition from smiling into a more neutral, almost somber expression. As if the film didn't want to show um, that facial transition and just let our imaginations uh, kind of hold the uh, possibilities of what that transition, um, the interior emotion, felt like for this character. Um, another kind of device of discontinuity is what we might call a non-diegetic insert. Um, and this is a preview to the uh, work and thought of Sergei Eisenstein, which we'll get in the next lesson. Um, but what is a non-diegetic insert? Um, well, the word diegetic, which we'll talk about uh, more in Sound Week, simply refers to that which is contained within the world of the film. So a non-diegetic insert is an image that doesn't seem to be in the world of the film. And you might imagine, what could that possibly be? Um, I think you'll get a sense of it when you see this opening from Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. So you'll see, you might have thought that the film, say, begins on a farm <laughs> with uh, sheep, and then you quickly discover that no, the sheep aren't really part of the world of the film. They are there rhetorically to comment uh, metaphorically on, a, on what we're making of this sea of people coming from the subway, suggesting that modern life has rendered the urban dweller like a sheep merely following the crowd, right? The sheep are just an image conveying that metaphor. They aren't diegetic, they are non-diegetic, merely a device of the narrator um, to tell us something about what's going on in the diegetic world. Um, one film that has a lot of non-diegetic inserts is Daisies. Um, these are clear examples of non-diegetic inserts throughout the film. And in Daisies, they are sometimes uh, purely anarchic, but if you, if you track their their locations throughout the film, they sometimes establish meaningful associations, right? So the non-diegetic inserts in the beginning uh, of the film, um, they give us images of destruction, 
right? Which is thematically important given how much um, the destruction of the two Maries uh, seems to be muted um, or at least uh, kind of rendered harmless by juxtaposition with um, actual warlike destruction, right? It asks us to kind of think of the theme of destruction, but also um, measure the, the kind of different um, uh, intensities of those two forms of destruction. We also get images like this, um, juxtaposed with a scene involving uh, nature, right? So they're, th they're thematically connected with the scene, which involves a kind of Garden of Eden scenario. Um, you'll get, uh, remember those images of locks um, that happen throughout? Well, that seems to resonate with this uh, moment in which we see a sign that says no admittance for women, which connects to the kind of latent feminism of this film. Um, and then you'll see uh, non-diegetic inserts of tons of cutouts of uh, models from magazines, which seems to comment upon the status of these two Maries as models, uh, as a, once again, a kind of feminist gesture to think about the kind of imposed um, structures of femininity to which these two women seem to um, adhere almost to an extreme degree. Okay, so next time we'll talk about the traditions of Soviet montage uh, and how they might help us understand the film Daisies.